There's actually a subtitle for this afternoon's talk, and that is, Nothing is Impossible. And that has guided my way for many years. And I just want to tell you that uh, every day when I walk over to the farm, I have to uh, cross uh, our farm pond. And, uh, Stop that, please. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who never thought it was possible to do that, nothing is impossible. I like the jacket. I like the My background before getting into farming was as an adventurer. I uh, climbed mountains was a rock climber, ski racer, raced whitewater water kayaks and took them down uh, rivers all over. And I always thought that patterned my approach to agriculture. Uh, I was, and the group of other loonies I hung out with, we were determined that nothing was impossible. We could do anything. Yeah. We can do that. I saw a sign once on a dive uh, recovery shop down in uh, Florida. And the sign on the wall said, the difficult, we do it once. The impossible may take a little longer. <laughs> Avery Levins, the well-known physicist who runs the center out near Aspen, had a quote in a magazine that I thought was particularly useful. He said, I don't do problems, I do solutions. And we were looking for solutions to climbing, skiing, and kayaking problems. We were, in the uh, words of the title of a book, conquistadors of the useless. <laughs> and so at some point in my life, I decided to be a conquistador of something more useful. And I traded first ascents and first descents down rivers for being the first at market with whatever crop I was trying to beat everybody else with. It was my new competition. But it was based, again, on the idea that nothing is impossible. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to take a chairlift or a helicopter to the top. The whole idea of nothing is impossible is that you can achieve whatever you want to achieve with minimal resources, just the resources of human beings. And I want to show you from the idea that nothing is impossible exactly how things have changed over the years. Back when I was climbing, uh, I did my first rock climb in 1957. And my last year in high school. And 1957 was the year that people made the first ascent on the nose on El Capitan in Yosemite. If you've ever seen pictures of it, it's a thousand foot tall, straight up rock wall. And the first ascent was done by three guys, three of the best climbers of their day, and it took them 42 days. Uh, sleeping in hammocks on the wall as they worked their way up. Over the next few years, once you prove something can be done, other people can do it in less time, and it got to the point where people were now climbing that in three days. Well, just from the point of view of what the future holds for us in organic agriculture, last summer, the record was set and it was two hours and 45 minutes. And this is called almost running up a thousand foot vertical cliff. So if you want to know that nothing is impossible, that is the distance that that particular feat has come in uh, 50, 60 years. Now, when I was kayaking with my loony friends, we would run any river we could find. If it was in flood, so much the better. It was utterly ridiculous. 
But we had a sense that any waterfall more than about 10 feet was probably not a good idea. And we walked a number of those. Well, recently, the world's record was set for going over waterfalls in a kayak. You see that little <laughs> thing there? This is a 189-foot waterfall in Washington State. He broke his paddle. That was about all that happened. So I put these in here just as an introduction to the idea that when I started as an organic farmer, I was told that what you're trying to do is impossible. I was told that by every egg professor, every extension agent, every uh, uh, feed store uh, owner I ever encountered. You can't do this, it's impossible. Uh, there is no such word as impossible. And over the years, we have pushed the possible, and we found that with that simple little bit of extra coverage, we were able to harvest crops all winter long uh, in, in the main winter, which looks a little bit like this and isn't everybody's idea of gardening at the time. <laughs> we were able to move large greenhouses. When we started moving greenhouses, we were told, well, yeah, maybe a little 10 by 20, but you'd never be able to move a commercial greenhouse. This is a 30-foot wide, 100-foot long greenhouse that we're moving very easily, and, and a young grower in Vermont, a wonderful kid who I think is probably the best young grower in the country, he moves 40-foot wide by 200-foot long, long greenhouses. So again, is it impossible? No, nothing is impossible. Well, you can't grow any of these crops in the winter because when they're up to harvest size, and they get frozen, they're going to turn to mush. Well, yeah, but what if we harvest them when they're young and vigorous and can freeze and thaw every night and not show any problem? So we can have winter salads. Well, you can't really make money growing in greenhouses because you can't grow enough. If anybody has ever read garden books, you'll be aware that an awful lot of garden books are written by people who read the previous garden books. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been going on for a long time. Well, back when people were farming with horses, you had to put the rows quite far apart to let the horse walk in between there and cultivate. And many of those same spacings made it into early garden books in the post-horse days. And so these are carrots in our winter greenhouse, 12 rows on a 30-inch bed with two inches between each carrot, and we're getting fabulous yields. And you, yes, you can do it in a greenhouse. <coughs> well, yeah, but you're never going to be able to turn out beautiful crops without pest holes in them and, uh, and leaves eaten. Well, Again, we've been doing this for 40-some years, and one of the most fascinating topics that I got into researching when I started was what is going on with this idea that the healthy plant isn't bothered by pests. <coughs> the more I looked into it, the more I found that we could turn out crops like that consistently. And we had one standard on the farm. If we had anything, that looked as bad as the stuff in the supermarket, we would compost it. <laughs> we were also told that, yeah, okay, maybe you can grow scallions and spinach in the winter, but you'll never be able to turn out a wide range of crops. Well, during most winters, we have about 12 different crops on the shelves of the stores we sell to and uh, in the kitchens of the chefs we sell to. There is a wide range of things that work very well in the winter greenhouse. Um, we were told, yeah, well, that's why you got the land for so little money, because it's uh, uh, three miles from the last paved road and, and six miles from a major road. No one will come out there and buy any produce if you open a farm stand. 
Well, we opened a farm stand, and guess what? If you have a good product, the customers will find you. We are that far from civilization. A Harvard Business School study would have written us off as a foolish concept, and yet we can sell, we could probably sell five times what we can grow right from this ridiculous location. And I put this in just at the end of this little introduction because the real secret, the real delight for me is figuring out how to grow crops that are so tasty that people would rather eat them than junk food. And these are the carrots we plant in uh, the 1st of August. We leave them in the ground. We slide a greenhouse over them to protect them with an inner layer so we can harvest them all winter long. And when you leave carrots in the cold ground like that, they turn some of their starch to sugar. They become the tastiest thing you ever ate in your life. And these, we have been told by parents in neighboring towns, are the trading item of choice in local grade school lunchbox. <laughs> in fact, Barbara was delivering early one morning to the food co-op, and the produce manager came to the back door. She was coming in, and he said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we're out of your carrots. She had just brought more. And there's a man sitting in his car in the parking lot waiting until you arrive because his daughter refuses to go to school. Without her carrots in her lunchbox. So, our small victory in some way. Now, nothing is impossible. So how do we know this? Organic farming, this is ridiculous. Well, I have a wonderful book on my shelf entitled Roman Farming. And Roman farming talks about what the Romans knew. And this is farming 2,000 years ago. And what did they know? They knew about crop rotations. They knew about green manures. They knew how good legumes were in a crop rotation. Yep, you've lost your. Yeah, I, I don't have any slides at the moment. That's supposed to be blank. Sorry about that. Maybe we could, let's see, I'll tell you what we'll do. No? Well, we'll just, okay, good. I'll let you know when I need it again. Thanks. So they were selecting seeds that worked best under certain conditions. They were incorporating livestock. All of the things we're doing today were known 2,000 years ago. And have we forgotten them? Well, up till recently we've forgotten them. But the interest in organic farming has really motivated people. I have a couple of wonderful uh, research documents here uh, that are trying to decide if, when you're setting up a crop rotation, known to the Romans, whether some crops are synergistic to others. Is there a really a beneficial effect, or are you just not planting the same crop there that was there last year? Lo and behold, there are fantastic synergistic effects that the recent research is pointing out. Corn yielded 17 to 18 percent more if it was preceded by a broadleaf crop. Um, uh, out, uh, corn yielded 22 percent more when it was in a rotation with alfalfa. Soybean yielded 13 percent more following barley than when it followed spring wheat. These are interesting facts. Uh, winter wheat yielded 46% more following fava beans compared to continuous winter wheat. In other words, there are some pretty fascinating biological things going on with what the crop roots leave in the soil and the effect on the next crop that we are only beginning to explore and only beginning to come up with information on them. There are also studies done on what's called allelopathy, one of these wonderful uh, uh, scientific words. And allelopathy is the negative effect of crops on either those growing next to them or those that are going to follow them. And again, studies are coming out more and more on this from the point of view that the simple little technique of crop rotation, which I thought always thought was wonderful because you get so much out of it, and it is a management input. It's coming from your head, not from anything you buy. That the potential in using that and setting up rotations is just beginning to be explored. 
green manures. Green manures were known to the Romans. And again, a wonderful way of making the soil better, but again, fascinating explorations. Explorations with deep rooting green manures. Now, the land I'm on, we have about six feet of soil, and it's only the top three inches was any good when we started, before we get down to bedrock. But when you're farming, you're taking minerals out of the soil in the crops you remove and selling them. What has been found that many of these deep rooting crops actually have the ability to etch minerals off the bedrock when they get down six feet and are bringing those nutrients up to the soil surface when you turn them under. This is a whole nother way of looking at a permanent agriculture because you are then being able to actually turn rock into next year's nutrients. And then there is lay farming, L-E-Y. Very few people have heard of it. It was a very popular idea in England uh, uh, between and after, between the wars and after the Second World War. And the basis of lay farming is you combine grazing livestock with crops that you're growing in tilled land. And what the researchers found that is if soil spends four years in a grass clover pasture grazed by livestock, at the end of that four years, you practically have virgin soil again because of the immense uh, amount of organic matter that the roots of both the grasses and legumes are putting into the soil. And leg farming was based on them plowing that up, getting a couple of years crops off of there, which are basically free crops based on the built up fertility, and then sowing it back down to grass and clover again. And if you think about this and you think about the, the world we live in and all the worry about erosion, well, the worry about erosion is because we are growing acres and acres in this country of grain, 80% of which goes to feed livestock, when all the studies show that the best thing grazing animals should eat is not grain but grass. Put that land back into grass and take advantage of the built up fertility after four years, for two years of uh, uh, any row crop you want, and then say wheat under sown back to grass and clover, and you have a system, almost a perpetual system, that you can keep going forever and ever. Another thing that is coming along are seeds that have benefits because the plants they grow contain phytochemicals, chemical compounds, that are useful in agriculture. And there is a whole science now based on certain mustards. And one of them is called uh, uh, Pacific Gold. Uh, uh, the other one is called, I forget what the name of that is. But what these have in them are high levels of uh, glucosinolates. I can never remember these long words. And the glucosinolates, when you till under this crop, as they decompose, they give off um, biologically active compounds that are very effective at getting rid of sclerotinia and verticillium wilt in the soil. So if you've been having soil problems, here is a green manure you can grow, one of these mustards that you chop up and turn under, and you have a biological way of dealing with problems. Again, this is all new information coming out, but it's a, a function of the future of what's going to go on in organic agriculture. And let's say we're growing in greenhouses. I have never thought that where we are today is as good as we're going to get. And the reason you know that is if you go back and read books in history. You go back 50 years and read about any science. And a book written 50 years ago will be acting as if the science of that day is it. We are here. We have reached it, baby. And now we know how to do it. And yet 50 years later, 
we can read this and we say, oh my God, those guys weren't even beginning, were they? Well, the plastics we're using now on greenhouses, would, is it possible that we could modify them in some way that they would reflect more heat back at night? That they would be clearer and let more sun in so more heat could come in? I guarantee you that developments like that are coming down the track just as soon as we can get there. More effective tools. Right now, on our farm, it takes six of us to run what the operation we have. I am working this winter with a Harvard uh, uh, engineer and uh, a couple of other farmers who have ideas similar to mine that we can, we can invent our future ourselves to come up with a small electric tractor. And it's more of a tool carrier than a tractor because it's going to have four equal sized wheels and you're going to sit in the back and you're going to be able to put equipment right in front of you where you can see it. And it's going to be designed for 30 inch wide beds. And it's going to have your bed prep, uh, tillers, cedars, cultivators on that. And we're convinced that we can have this made by somebody. We have no desire to make it ourselves. Anyone who would like to go into the tractor business, speak to me afterwards. We will give you this free design and business. Please make it and sell me one. <laughs> we are convinced that this can be made and sold for $4,000, the type of money a small farmer can afford. With that tractor, I could send two of the six people who work on my farm off to successfully start their own farm because now they would need two fewer people. That's what a difference it would make. New equipment. Another thing we're working on is a way to harvest baby leaf salads. If you've seen the way the bagged salad is harvested in California, uh, they have a few advantages. They're called laser level fields. They're called harvesting machines with a bandsaw blade that's five feet wide and goes down the bed. And as the material is cut, it goes on a belt that raises it up and dumps it into tubs, and there's people standing behind handing the tubs up onto the truck that's going back to wash it. And the small farmers, at least around me and probably up here, are cutting their baby leaf salad with a knife like this. That's a very unequal game. And we're coming up with a small box that's going to be uh, about 15 inches wide, so you can go down one half of a 30 inch bed and it's going to have a cutter on the front and little skids on the bottom. And the skids, you can change the height of them. So at whatever height you want to cut the crop, you can do it. You just slide this along the ground, dump it into your harvest tub, and you're going to be actually competing at a far better rate. Why have these things not been made before? Probably because nobody thinks there's a future for small farming. We definitely think there's a future for small farming. Another thing that's being worked on by a lot of people for the future is better cold hardiness for crops for growing in winter conditions. There's a wonderful, uh, a very innovative farmer in Maryland named Brett Grosgall. And I first became interested in what Brett was doing because I read an article where he thought people who used greenhouses were sissies. And I thought this was, this was great. Here was a guy in Maryland who was determined that he was going to harvest crops all winter long without a greenhouse. And so he has, he's using a lot of uh, Asian greens. Many of these Asian greens are incredibly hardy, but also things like arugula that all of us want to grow. And he has been leaving them in the field and selecting the ones that are still alive at the end of the winter and getting his seeds from those and continuing to cross them. And he now has uh, an even star arugula, which you can find in the Fedco catalog, which is the hardiest arugula out there. And it's just simple things like that that people are working on that are going to uh, really change the, the future. Do healthy plants resist pests? I'm convinced they, they do, but how do you know what a healthy plant is and how do you get there? There is all sorts of fascinating new research going on, uh, much of it uh, done by a Professor Larry Phelan at uh, Ohio State, looking into exactly what is going on in the soil when you have soils where this, this plant is not being bothered by bugs and other soils where it is. 
And there was some fascinating research done by the USDA itself at their research uh, farm in Beltsville, Maryland, where they have been growing tomatoes side by side for many years. S exactly the same plants, only this section here, they are transplanted into black plastic mulch. And this section here, they grew a winter cover crop of hairy vetch, killed it mechanically, and transplanted the plants through the hairy vetch. And for years, they noticed that the plants in the hairy vetch stayed healthier longer, yielded more, and had much uh, uh, cleaner fruit. And they have uh, geneticists on staff who can study the genes of plants. They can actually do these genes, little uh, sort of gene report cards on what's going on in the plant. And what they found out was the exact same plant, side by side, exact same conditions, and yet the tomato plants growing through the black plastic mulch were not turning on the genes responsible for uh, the longevity of production and for uh, protection of the, the fruit and the plant against uh, insects. The genes were not turning on. I thought this was some of the most fascinatingly uh, significant research I'd ever read. There was a small article on it in the Times and then it just disappeared. But I guarantee you more and more stuff like that will be coming out so we can pin down exactly what is going on with healthy plants. What about the rest of the world? Does the rest of the world think we're on the right track? It sure does. The UN, the World Bank, and the FAO put out a study a few years ago, IAASTD study, and it stood for the International Assessment of Agriculture, Science, and Technology for Development. This was a massive study, lots of scientists involved, and what they came to the conclusion was the future of agriculture and feeding all the hungry people in the world had no GMOs, had traditional plant breeding, less processed foods, and a far higher profile for traditional and local agricultural knowledge. Every country in the UN was involved in that study. It's funny we haven't heard anything about it. That's because three countries Australia, Canada, and the U.S. refused to sign on to the final report. And I doubt if it was even hardly mentioned in the American press. And yet this is the, the conclusion of all of these scientists about the future of what's going on in agriculture. What was the name of that study again? I-A-A-S-T-D. International Assessment of Agriculture, Science, and Technology for Development. And you can get the whole study and the, the shorter versions of it. Um, natural systems, and that's what I'm working with as an organic farmer, do natural systems really work? I mean, can we depend on them? So what is science coming up with on this? Wonderful, I love it when I read these things. A study that the importance of soil organic matter is more appreciated every day, even though, as a recent study concluded, it is arguably the most complex and least understood component of soils. It's the thing that makes it all work and it's hardly been studied yet. A professor named Harry Hoytink at Ohio State, and it's really nice when this work is done by these people rather than, than by uh, some small farmer in Maine with no uh, uh, letters after his name who no one's going to believe anyway. <laughs> Harry Whiting, professor at Ohio State, was working with compost. Can compost control plant diseases? The result of his work is that it, uh, that it can, and he referred to this as systemic acquired resistance. In other words, something is happening to the plants growing in compost that is making them more resistant. I'm sure he could have found a simpler name like that, like making plants more healthy rather than systemic acquired resistance, but that is what is, is going on and what people are learning.